The Avalon in Hollywood, the polls, the pundits, the press have all that anointed shift the next senator from California, Alex and Christine. But before uh, he starts picking out furniture for his new office, he has to count today's votes and win the runoff in November. He's well aware of that. We're still in full campaign mode when we caught up with him voting this morning in Burbank. It's been just wonderful traveling up and down the state, meeting Californians uh, in every part of the state. And I think they're... They're looking for someone in the Senate that will take on the big fights, will defend our democracy, but also knows how to get things done. We'll deliver more affordable housing, more affordable child care. Uh, we'll help meet uh, the cost of living. Schiff with his wife Eve at a vote center. After two decades in the House of Representatives, again, he spoke briefly to reporters after voting this morning. He has most major endorsements, a 30-plus million dollar war, war chest, and name recognition far beyond Southern California due largely to his role taking on former President Trump. But Schiff's campaign strategy has been interesting. Most of his money has been spent on promoting, if you will, some would call it attacking his rookie Republican rival Steve Garvey, the former Dodger, raising Garvey's profile while minimizing his Democratic opponents, Katie Porter and Barbara Lee. Democrats agree conservative Republican Steve Garvey is the wrong choice for the Senate. Our Republican opponent here on this stage uh, has voted for Donald Trump twice. Mr. Garvey, you voted for him twice. So if you follow politics, you know here in California, Democrats outnumber Republicans about two to one. So, of course, Schiff would rather face a Republican than a fellow Democrat in November. Some have criticized him for these campaign tactics. Others think it's quite sophisticated. I talked about the election with Betty Yee, the vice chair of the state's Democratic Party, which, by the way, has not endorsed a candidate. But it's good news for us, for sure. Um, we think that, um, you know, frankly, um, Steve Garvey has not really proven himself to be a substantive candidate. And uh, we know that, um, you know, that Congress Congressman Schiff has been, uh, you know, really getting some nationwide attention with respect to participation as being, you know, really kind of um, you know, resistor number one against Trump with all of the, in all the capacities in which he served. So um, it would be uh, delightful news, but frankly, any one of the three candidates would be delightful news for us uh, going into no November against Steve Garvey. So that's the prediction. Uh, Schiff and Garvey. Garvey splits the rest of the Democratic vote. Those two face off in November and Schiff wins easily. Of course, anything can happen, as they say. Live in Hollywood at the Avalon. I'm Phil Schumann, Fox 11 News. Alex Christine. Of course, Katie Porter's not going to like that prediction. She's hoping to make the top two. Let's talk more, though, about Republican Steve Garvey right now. Fox 11's Laura Diaz is live at his election night party right now near his home in Palm Desert. Laura. Yes, Christine, I'm here at Garvey headquarters in Palm Desert. I can tell you that he is not due to arrive here until about 9.30 tonight. Right now, I'm going to step aside, and you can see that it's actually very sedate. They're setting up the room, and they tell us that there will be hundreds of people here this evening, but that's really not even that portion won't even start until 7 o'clock tonight. Um, we are going to show you some video of Mr. Garvey from his baseball days. Of course, he is very famous for his his time as a Dodger and as a Padre and he's been able to utilize that star quality that he possesses as someone who was so beloved as a Dodger and then again as a Padre and uh, in recent weeks of course what we have found is that he has been surging and my colleague Phil just alluded to that of course that was because Mr. Schiff featured him in a huge media blitz and it has raised his recognition factor. So that along with his beloved time as a Dodger and also as a Padre has fared very well for him. You know, what becomes of that? Many people are predicting that he will be in the general election in November. But as Phil just said, anything can happen in politics. So we're going to be keeping a close eye. We are told that he voted by mail earlier today. So we don't have any pictures of him actually in any kind of a precinct but we will keep you posted when people start to arrive you never know some celebrities could make their way here tonight i'm laura diaz reporting live from garvey headquarters now back to the studio alex and chris well with those poll numbers reason to have a party all right laura thanks much live look now at what could be the most crucial building in los angeles on this super tuesday evening it's where ballots go to be counted 
This milk processing center sits in the city of industry. It only opened last month. It used to be a Fry's electronic store. Only credentialed workers are allowed inside. The glass windows allow us to peek in. The tallying process is also live streamed for all Angelinos and the rest of the world to see. You can find that link on our website, foxla.com. Will a measure aimed at making streets safer actually compromise safety in the city of L.A.? That's what voters in the city of Los Angeles are deciding right now. Its measure HLA would install hundreds of miles of street improvements such as wider sidewalks and dedicated bike lanes. The measure aims to reduce the skyrocketing number of traffic deaths by speeding up the pace of street improvements outlined in the city's 2015 mobility plan. But opponents say HLA could slow emergency response times and worsen traffic. They also worry about the costs. And there is Prop 1. It is a statewide bond measure aimed at mental health care. Supporters of Prop 1 say it's a major step to tackle homelessness. It does come with a $6.38 billion price tag. Governor Newsom has been campaigning statewide for this prop. The measure would take monies from a voter-approved tax on millionaires, shifting those funds to additional housing for homeless individuals and veterans, plus increasing spending on mental health care and drug or alcohol treatment facilities. Opponents say the measure would take much-needed money from effective health services. Prop 1, though, is widely expected to pass. We'll see. <laughs> Poll numbers have changed on that in the last few days. Uh, with voters deciding on those measures, polling places have been open since 7 o'clock this morning, drawing a steady stream of voters at some locations, but not so much at others. Fox 11's Hal Eisner out at Pan Pacific Park at one of those polling places. You've been talking to voters about what they're interested in. It looks like there's some folks there now. Yeah, you know, voter uh, workers here, poll workers, tell me that it's been very busy at this vote center. This is the Senior Citizen Center at Pan Pacific Park. So many important races. About 400 people have come through here, according to the poll workers. We've been talking with some of those voters about their votes. Uh, let's hear what some of them said about Proposition 1, that mental health measure that would fund mental health beds and treatment centers. Proposition 1, how did you vote for that? No. Why? Because it's a lot of money. Proposition 1. Yes. You support that? Yeah. Well, why, why did you support Why was that important? It was important because I work in the mental health field, so I thought that we've needed funding for a while. I voted no, um, particularly because I had heard that it is, in, it is designed to redirect money from uh, funds that already exist. Prop one, I'm a yes vote on that because I we need mental health. We need we need help for these people. Such an interesting population of voters here at this particular vote center. Some young who are voting for the first time, some much older who have voted many times, and so many issues they're having to take a look at and, and make decisions on. At six o'clock, we'll take a look at Measure HLA. Alex Christine, back to you. All right, Hal, thank you much. We take a look now at a polling site at the North Hollywood Recreation Center, which will be open until 8 o'clock. We asked voters why they decided to cast their ballots in important races for district attorney, the L.A. County Board of Supervisors, and the L.A. City Council. For L.A. Council, um, I, I did have a particular candidate. I've been voting since I was 18, so uh, I just feel as an American, we have that right. A lot of my friends have been talking about it, you know, that social pressure to vote. But there's so much at stake that we, we all have to exercise our right to vote before it goes away. As we've been talking about this, voters will also decide on that ballot initiative aimed at making roadways safer for pedestrians and cyclists. San Bernardino's Ballot Mobile ends its tour of duty today. The county registrar's office launched its first ever traveling voter education pop-up back in January. The goal was to visit all 24 cities in the county to deliver voter education materials ahead of today's primary. Today's final stop was outside the county registrar's office. Tonight, California and 16 other states and one U.S. territory, American Samoa, holding presidential primaries. President Biden has already won Iowa, essentially unchallenged in a mail-in primary there. Former President Trump, you see him here, projected to win Virginia's 48 Republican delegates with nearly 65 percent of the vote. According to the Fox News decision desk, former Governor Haley has 33 percent. This was widely seen as her best chance to win 
a state with significant delegates at stake and doesn't look like she's doing all that well there right now. 74 Republican delegates up for grabs in North Carolina. Polls here just closed about a half hour ago. Fox News projects Trump winning there. He's at 73 percent. Haley is at 23 percent. 150 Republican delegates up for grabs in Texas. The polls closed at the top of the hour. Right now, Trump at 75 percent. Nikki Haley at 20 percent. Here is a look at Tennessee. 58 Republican delegates at stake there. It is early. One percent of votes counted. <laughs> look at that. Runaway for Donald Trump. 88 to 11. So we will see. Nikki Haley is supposed to speak in South Carolina tonight. Could this be the night where she concedes and gives up? Those numbers so far not looking too yeah, good for her. That's the big question. Does she continue to stay in this race? Talking elections here. Seven city council seats are at stake tonight in Los Angeles. One of the most closely watched is District 14. That is Kevin DeLeon's seat. And eight challengers are fighting for it. DeLeon is seeking a second four-year term. The 57-year-old has worked to rebuild his image following the leaked racist audio scandal at City Hall more than a year ago. Among his eight challengers are two assembly members, Miguel Santiago and Wendy Carrillo. Also among the eight, a hard left tenant rights attorney named Isabel Harado. Today, DeLeon joined a lowrider caravan for Get Out the Vote drive across Council District 14. The drive started and ended at Plaza de la Raza. De Leon and the Lowrider Caravan encourage people to vote across District 14, which includes Royal Heights, Lincoln Heights, downtown LA, and El Sereno. But today, I am amazed and honored to be with these brothers and sisters here today. Our Lowriders were part of our culture right here in LA, am I right? Yes, sir. Right. Yeah. Folks may say I've been involved in politics for a long time. The reason why I get involved in politics is because if you don't get involved in politics, politics gets involved with you, ultimately, at the end of the day. That's why I tell folks, get out there and vote. And there you have Kevin DeLeon campaigning on this election day, last day to vote. It is Super Tuesday, and we are tracking contests across the country and here at home. One of those, and this one is being followed all over the country, yep. the race for L.A. County District Attorney. Current D.A. George Gascon facing a crowded field of opponents. Eleven candidates are battling for his job, the L.A. County's top prosecutor job. You see them here. A mix of prosecutors and candidates offering what they see as a more moderate approach to criminal justice. Most are challenging a number of Gascon policies, framing a narrative of out-of-control crime in Los Angeles. Fox 11's Christy Bajardo is following this race. She joins us live with What's at Stake. She's going to be speaking with the DA shortly. Christy. Alex and Christine, as you know, District Attorney George Gascon was elected right after the George Floyd protests on a wave of support for justice reform. And now his rivals are trying to make this election a referendum on those reforms, which is why, as you said, this race is getting national attention. The New York Times is following it. So is the Washington Post. But this election is expected to have low voter turnout. And we found plenty of Angelinos who had no idea who was even running. Take a look. Do you have any thoughts on that? On the DA's race? Yeah. Uh, you know what? I'm not that informed on it, to be honest. I'm a court employee. I cannot talk about our DA. I wish I could. Do you guys have any thoughts on the DA's race? And that is the challenge for Gascon's 11 rivals in this election, including some of his employees like Jonathan Hatami and John McKinney, who are running to replace them. There are also judges like Deborah Archuleta and Craig Mitchell on the ballot. Gascon won election on policies that were popular with justice reform advocates, like not seeking the death penalty and not charging minors as adults. But those policies made him the target of two failed recall attempts and have drawn the ire of victims' rights advocates and police unions who have blamed his policies for rising crime. Gascon, though, argues that crime rates went up around the country at the same time and are now declining in L.A. County, and that has won over some voters. I voted for Gascon. Why? Uh, he seemed qualified and experienced, and uh, sounds like he'd be good to stay on the job. Gascon needs more than 50% of the vote to avoid a runoff, and most political experts do not believe he will get that. And 
Uh, Run-ups have not been kind to incumbents in L.A. County in recent years. You think of Jackie Lacey, his predecessor, also a Sheriff Villanueva and his predecessor, McDonald, both lost during runoffs. And coming up in the next hour, we are going to speak to D.A. George Gascon about what his thoughts are on this election and how he feels it's going so far. Live in downtown L.A., I'm Christy Fajardo. Let's send it back to you. All right, Christy, thank you so much. Let's talk about the Senate race now. Katie Porter is fighting for hoping to be in the top two tonight in the race for Senate. That's what she needs to do to move on. If the polls are right, that might be tough. Recently, she's been polling, it appears to be in third place behind Steve Garvey and Adam Schiff. Fox 11's Matthew Seedorf is with Katie Porter supporters in Long Beach. How's it going there? Well, the doors don't open for this watch party until 8 o'clock tonight, right when polls close. But I will say her camp today seems cautiously optimistic going into tonight. Now, if you take a look at this video, this is from Saturday. Katie Porter in Irvine turning in her mail-in ballot. In the latest Berkeley IGS poll, Steve Garvey was on top with 27% support among likely voters, followed by Adam Schiff, 25%, and Porter at 19 Now, most experts believe Porter needs big voter turnout numbers to be in the top two of this race. But going into Super Tuesday, that really hadn't been the case. Something we talked with her about Saturday, she blamed her opponent. We're seeing pretty high turnout among Republican voters. And part of that is the bulk of the money that my opponent Adam Schiff has spent has been to turn out Republican voters. So I think that is a factor here in high Republican turnout. I think Democrats should be very careful about feeding it because it will come back to hurt us in November. We also asked her how she's feeling going into election night, Super Tuesday. Her full answer tonight at 6, six o'clock. We're live. Matthew Cedor, Fox 11 News. All right, we will see you then, Matthew. Thank you. I want to be joined now by Politico's Melanie Mason, who teamed with us to host the first uh, Senate debate here on Fox 11. Uh, and she does such great reporting on Politico all along. So, so Mel, when we first started this process, which was over a year ago, <laughs> there was sort of an assumption by a lot of folks in the political press corps that it would be an Adam Schiff, Katie Porter, top two. Now, not so much. What happened to Katie Porter, and, and does she have a real shot of making it into the top two? That's absolutely right. There was always a question of whether the state Republican Party, which has had a tough time in California in recent years, would be able to find a candidate that can consolidate enough of the Republican vote. And it took until late fall of last year for Steve Garvey to appear. And what we've seen is that Steve Garvey does appear, because of some of the polls, to have gotten a good chunk of that Republican vote. And in a primary where there is a competitive Republican presidential primary, a primary where the electorate tends to skew more conservative anyway, he may benefit from those Republican voters turning out. And of course, he has certainly benefited, as Congressman Porter talked about in that report, from this spending from uh, Congressman Adam Schiff. Um, Adam Schiff spent a lot of money to highlight just how conservative he considers Steve Garvey to be. And that was a big flashing signal to Republican voters that that was the candidate that they should align behind. So we'll find out in a couple of hours or, or maybe in a couple of days whether that strategy panned out. Well, it's looking like it's going to be a good night for Steve Garvey tonight. Our reporter is at uh, his Palm Desert party tonight. Uh, could be a good night for him to have a party. But what about if he does make it to the general election? Should Adam Schiff or whoever makes it into that other slot be worried? Should Democrats be worried? Well, look, there's no such thing as a sure thing in politics, but let's look at the math in California. California is a deep blue state. Democrats have a uh, registration advantage, particularly when we're looking at a presidential election year, where in November the turnout is much more likely to skew more liberal, more uh, younger, and more diverse. All of those are voters who are less likely to galvanize between a behind a Republican candidate, and particularly a candidate like Garvey, who, quite frankly, hasn't been doing very much in terms of running a campaign. It might be pretty tough for him in a one-on-one -on -one, uh, against an experienced Democratic opponent uh, to really uh, uh, show his, put his best foot forward. Let's say so I think it might be tough going forward but if he does make it into the into the general election that's a pretty remarkable trajectory for somebody who was not even in this race a couple of months ago meanwhile because Porter and Schiff ran for Senate they weren't allowed to run for their house seats so there'll be new people in those seats um, let's talk about Porter's district California 47 
widely expected that Scott Baugh is going to be the Republican there, but unclear who's going to be in second place in terms of the Democrats. And there's been a nasty fight between Dave Min, the state senator, and a relative newcomer in Joanna Weiss. That's right. And let's talk about why Democrats are fighting so hard. This is one of the seats in California that Democrats have to retain if there's going to have any hope at all of being able to win back control of the House nationally in November. So this is one of the few places where Democrats are playing defense. And so they have these two candidates who are battling it out to say, I am the more electable Democrat to keep that seat blue in the fall. The truth is, is that it's very hard to see a scenario where Democrats can win back the House overall if they lose this seat. And so we have seen just a real slugfest of negative ads, particularly between these two Democrats, uh, Dave Min and Joanna Weiss. And I think that that just reflects the real urgency and anxiety of what happens when Democrats lose a real powerhouse candidate like Katie Porter from running in that seat. All right, politicals. Melanie Mason, busy night for you, I'm sure.